everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Scott Robinson, uh, director of the Reed Center at NYU Shack Institute. I'm also a clinical professor uh, where I teach capital markets uh, and the capstone or thesis class. Uh, I have in the past taught the REIT securities analysis class uh, that is currently being taught by David Harris, uh, our, our guest today. Uh, David's career spans uh, both Wall Street and private real estate markets. Uh, I invited him in today uh, to talk about uh, the REIT market, where we are both on the equity side as well as in the credit markets, uh, and to layer in an economic and, and real estate discussion on this. Uh, I invited David to this conversation, uh, one, because I, I really respect his views uh, on the market, uh, but two, uh, he's really been through a number of cycles at this point. Uh, he's half my age, uh, but he's been in the uh, he's been in the REIT space. He's been on Wall Street really since the the early days. We were just chatting uh, when REITs really started coming to market in, in the mid '90s. Um, and before his career in Wall Street, uh, he was an appraiser uh, over in the UK. Uh, so he kind of has this robust. Uh, private and public market uh, experience. I wanted him to, 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 to come into the fold on this. Um, before we get started here, I want to remind everybody uh, of uh, an upcoming event we have, uh, or series of events rather. Uh, obviously, Dean Shan has done a great job of putting NYU Shack uh, squarely in the digital uh, economy with our omni-channel presence, um, doing a lot of stuff on Zoom uh, this past spring and summer and into the fall. Uh, as we wrap up the Re leadership series, we've got a few more uh, coming up in the next few weeks. Um, do want to remind you of the upcoming Capital Markets Leadership Series, very similar uh, style, uh, but more of a focus on the broader capital markets. Uh, you can see registration material uh, in linked down on the lower uh, portion of this slide. Uh, definitely tune in for that, it should be a great conversation. Um, so what I want to do today, though, uh, David, uh, I think we're going to have a frank conversation uh, about uh, the, the broader economy, uh, the REIT market, of course, and, and real estate fundamentals. Uh, one of the things I love about the real estate capital markets uh, is that we need to, to be aware and knowledgeable in all of these different ecosystems um, because we are impacted by what's going on in the economy and obviously the, the property market as well. Uh, so I wanted to kick things off. Uh, there's obviously a lot to talk about. Uh, I feel like the velocity of news has slowed a little bit compared to March, April, and May, but the breadth and scope of the news uh, hasn't changed at all. There's just so much coming at us <clears throat> uh, every day and every week, uh, whether it's on Twitter, which, you know, we can get into that when we talk about politics a little bit, um, or if it's economic news, uh, real estate news, whatnot. Um, so I want to spend a little bit time uh, of time trying to delineate uh, kind of where we are um, and, and what we are kind of looking forward to in the next few quarters. Um, so here on slide four, uh, this is the, I should, should reiterate, this is the, the, fir the third of this faculty series uh, discussing the REIT market. I've maintained some of the material from, from prior uh, presentations because some of the core uh, topics we'll be discussing really haven't changed too much, but they have evolved. So I wanted to, to keep that content in here. Uh, most notably, this timeline on the top, um, I think initially the containment efforts were meant to be two weeks, quickly became four weeks, then 12 weeks, um, and it's bounced around a lot. Um, and then we have, we've been going through a reopening process uh, and then I'll, I'll put quotes around a recovery. Um, I'm still a little bit hesitant to use the word recovery. Um, I think we've recovered from the economic uh, shutdown related to the containment efforts, but I don't know that we're into an economic recovery just yet. I think there's still a lot of uncertainty on what the near term looks like, um, both from COVID and containment, but also economic fallout from what we've done so far. Um, and then layer into that, a lot of the political uncertainty uh, around both monetary and fiscal F policy efforts um, to kind of bolster and hopefully recover the economy. So therefore, I'm not really calling it a recovery just yet, um, but that's kind of the, the area that I think we're segueing into. Um, so with that backdrop a little bit, David, you and I had, uh, we obviously speak, speak on a regular basis, but we had a few conversations leading up to today's presentation. We kind of mapped out some things that, that we've really been focused on, I think, uh, obviously, this is not all inclusive, but over the past month or so, um, thinking about monetary policy and what the Fed has done uh, to kind of bolster the capital markets, 
uh, whether there has been some minor or significant unintended consequences to that vis-a-vis -vis equity market earnings multiples, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, credit spreads in, in the bond market. We can discuss that. Um, but we've also been looking at, at fiscal policies. Uh, I think some of that stimulus has, has definitively stalled. Uh, not sure where we're going to go from here, but there was clearly uh, a positive impact from uh, the CARES package effort um, with respect to economic demand. Um, and, and, but there still remains uh, uncertainty on what the recovery and reopening looks like. So uh, I think that conversation will continue. Uh, one of the other topics that, that I spoke about when I started this series back in April was that this uh, containment effort was really going to accelerate our evolution into Industry 4.0. Um, it's funny, I, uh, I tend to bastardize a Hemingway quote, uh, things happen slowly, then all at once. I think the retail sector has been grappling with Industry 4.0 for the past, you know, call it three, four, five years. Um, looking to figure out how to operate in an omni-channel environment. I feel like now suddenly the rest of the economy is trying to figure that out, whether it's academic and, and how we teach uh, both online and in person or it's work. We try to figure out how to conduct both work from home and some sort of in the office uh, scheduling. I feel like the rest of the economy is now suddenly having to deal with um, this omni-channel environment vis-a-vis -vis Industry 4.0, so we can speak about what we've, we've been seeing on that. And then, uh, importantly for the REIT space, uh, would love to hear your thoughts and we can dig into uh, the investor base um, and, and how generalist, the, the mix between generalist and dedicated investors has impacted uh, funds flows and valuations and, and call it multiple thinking. Um, and then on the other side of the page, uh, we can talk about what the future holds. So obviously I think we could spend all day uh, talking on this page, um, but why don't I take a breath there, uh, David, and, and hand it off to you. Uh, I, I should should note, I, I apologize for not doing this on the upfront. Uh, David Harris, uh, in addition to being uh, an adjunct uh, faculty here at NYU Shack, uh, he's also a REIT portfolio manager uh, for a large pension plan. Uh, so he obviously uh, puts his money where his mouth is every day uh, with his buy side activity. So. With that, okay, David. Well, thank, thank you for the intro. Just a small correction there. It's an alternative asset manager as opposed to a pension fund. Uh, we run about a uh, short $2 billion in a variety of funds, principally in, in REITs, but other areas as well, like micro cap and, um, and high, other high yield areas, which I do get involved in a little bit on those other things. And just a just point of reference there is, is this is now, if I conclude this last period as a recession, this is now the fifth. But uh, going back, you know, even I'm not old enough to remember the point of reference uh, from a, uh, um, a um, pan pandemic situation, which would be going back to 1919 and the Spanish flu. Although I have to say, it has prompted me, although you know, I sort of grew up with some of that coming from the UK, uh, we were affected badly by that and obviously had just got through the First World War. Um, so I had some sort of you know, knowledge that there was a major uh, flu epidemic, what we call the flu epidemic then, and it caused many deaths. I think actually more people died in the UK than died actually in the war, which was a pretty remarkable thing. But I think some of the history there actually teaches us, and to go back to um, Scott's word of caution as to whether we're in a recovery here, although clearly 100 years on, our abilities to uh, to manage this from a medicinal viewpoint, with vaccines, and therapeutics, etc. Um, you know, very many people who know a great deal more about this than I do, are, are very fearful that we could actually be seeing a second wave which could be far more damaging and not clearly have profound economic uh, circumstances as well. So just to touch upon some of these issues, and we certainly can dig a lot deeper and we welcome any questions that you might have. I mean, in terms of monetary and fiscal policy, um, although my career goes back uh, 30, 40 years, and I have spent more and more time actually looking at macro and at macroeconomic issues and capital markets, and, and less time on uh, real estate as my as time has gone on, quite frankly. And we can talk about the reasons for that. You know, but uh, um, I do spend a lot of my day looking at uh, you know monetary policy, fiscal policies, taxation, etc., and trying to figure out from the top down what will influence the stock prices of the real estate, the public real estate companies. Uh, but Going back to what we saw in, in March and April, 
um, uh, really an un an, uh, in terms of the scale and the speed at which monetary policy and fiscal policy uh, support was brought in. And obviously from a monetary side, we saw the Fed take slash rates uh, a couple of times down to zero um, and um, stand by and ramp up its quantitative easing and it has stepped into the market where there's been dislocation subsequently. Um, I think the biggest event, uh, biggest news that we've seen in the last six months since their action on the monetary side was the declaration only a month or so ago from the Fed that they expected to keep rates at effectively zero for the next three years. This is an extraordinary green light for the price of risk assets. And I, risk assets, I include uh, equities generally uh, and specifically uh, real estate, which is a direct influence to us. It's rare too that you see fiscal policy, i.e. governments move as rapidly and in coordination with what they're seeing on the monetary side. Um, and we know there's been several billion dollars thrown at this with the, the CARES Act initially, uh, both through industry, small business obviously was the target, but also at the individual level. Obviously, if uh, the, at the individual level, uh, the more money you can get into the hands of the people who are low income, or in the case of the unemployed, no income, that has the biggest bang for your buck in terms of spending money because you give tax breaks to the wealthy, they go and save it. It doesn't have the multiplier effect, whereas um, if you give those, they get, they give that support for people who need to go and spend it to, put, to pay the rent, to buy food, to pay for health insurance, that immediately has a multiplier effect through the economy. So very speedy response. Put that some, put some idea of the scale of this thing. As I said, it's been several trillion dollars. Obviously, uh, we have stalled out and there is actually news overnight yesterday and today as to whether we're going forward with the second stimulus. And again, I'll probably leave that open for uh, Scott to come on or, 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 or any questions that we might get at the end of the session. Uh, but you know, to put this, as I say, the scale of the fiscal policies that we support that we've seen already, and I would call it support rather than stimulus at this point. Basically, we're backstopping, backfilling that which we've lost. Um, it's about 15% of GDP has been thrown at the economy. So this is a truly enormous number. Um, and, um, you know, we're basically, we're not fiscal hawks any longer. I mean, particularly uh, parties on the right have been concerned about the explosion of the public debt. This is the time when you let public debt rip. And then when things are, when the economy starts to improve, you hopefully start to exhibit some discipline. Of course, to remind everybody, and maybe I'm digging too deep on the economic side here, I don't know, but the United States has a unique status as being the world's reserve currency. So basically, for the moment, we have a freer hand to issue, whereas other countries um, even developed economies um, are more constrained in terms of you know the amount of debt that they can actually run up. So I'll move on. In terms of uh, secular and sec cyclical and secular trends, uh, and again, I think I'd probably leave further dis more detailed discussion if we get this in Q and A. Is is one of my jobs that I spend a good deal of time thinking about um, is in in a real estate context and in terms of stock select reach stock selection. Is, is how much is happening cycl cyclically so that you could say buy a, a bond out retail stock hoping that the retail industry bounces back. Uh, you know, so probably a bad example to choose, but uh, for example, CBD office. I mean, there's a whole debate here and I don't have a deep, deep, any definitive view on, on whether CBD office comes back. My inclination to think is it's gonna take a couple of years and then it will be back. Uh, but, uh, you know, two years is a long time in the investment game, so it's probably a little early to go buy those. But you're playing a cycle there, whereas secular trends, and again, probably you, to use the retail ex um, uh, example as a better example in this context, is, you know, basically COVID has really acted as an accelerator of trends that were already in place. If you look at the data uh, from Commerce Department, is retail e-commerce e sales were growing at about 15% and represented, if you really got at the numbers, about 15% of total sales. Uh, that number in the second quarter went to 44%, right, in terms of growth, year over year growth. So I think it comes down again as, the, as bricks and mortar open up and we get hopefully a vaccine sooner rather than later. So people will feel um, comfortable going out to the physical place. Uh, but I think, you know, undoubtedly, 
uh, very rapid rates of growth. And maybe even if we revert back to 15%, the question I always ask myself about retail is, if it's 15% of total sales now, it's not stopping anytime soon. Does it get to 30? Does it get to 45? Does it even get to 50? But those numbers would seem to indicate that we're going to continue to see secular pressure on retail, retail bricks and mortar for the foreseeable future. Um, and so I'm trying to disaggregate when I make calls on stocks, which may look bombed out at the moment. Are we going to bounce back with a recovery in the economy? Um, and we can talk about the different property types in a later slide, or are we going to be looking at secular trends, uh, which seem at least now to be largely set in stone and one that needs to be pretty cautious about going forward. Um, I don't think we have a chart in here of uh, the weightings of the NARI index. I think, uh, Scott, you put in the performance, which is probably, I'll leave that comment then for that section. But what's really been fascinating, and I know Scott, kind of uh, picked up on a paper I wrote probably five years ago now, um, uh, shortly after the, the, uh, the inclusion of data centers and in particular, the cell towers within to the NARI index. And they were basically kind of sniffed at uh, by many traditional read investors. You know, you can't live in a, <laughs> you can't spend time in the day, you can't spend time at night under the roof of a cell tower. Uh, but those companies now, uh, formed the biggest single individual sector. Uh, American Tower is the biggest individual stock within the sector with a weighting over 10%. And they are continuing to show growth um, and have been growing rapidly relative to the more established areas of real estate. Um, and that kind of is a challenge for investors to get there. And, and leads me on to the next point down on the left-hand side is um, probably 12 years ago, 13 years ago, uh, the S&P 500 committee, um, and they kind of act on their own rules. There's no kind of set formula. Um, after some pressure from NAREIT actually uh, took in equity residential as the first company to be REIT to be included within the, um, uh, the real estate. And I pencil this out as my note was crossing the Rubicon because as pretty, uh, anybody interested in history, of course, crossing the Rubicon was when Caesar advanced with his army and started conquering the lands north of uh, where their existing territory was but basically you're not coming back once you cross you're in a whole new world and now we've got probably 15 20 reads i forget i lose track and, and really that was kind of a bit of a landmark in terms of moving forward um, in terms of moving away from just being a niche sector which only some people appreciated um, it was growing in importance and people did know about it, but it certainly broadened the investor base considerably. Fast forward to a couple of years ago, uh, and GIC is the general investment category. Uh, that's what that, the GICS stands for. Um, and um, uh, there we saw uh, real estate created as a separate, the 11th separate category. Um, and, um, and so within the S&P. So that then liked alongside things like telecom, um, and uh, healthcare and financials. And so it had its own designation. Now that absolutely more than the inclusion of a couple of REITs meant that general investors had to pay attention to their wading to, um, to, to REITs uh, essentially. Um, and it has meant that, um, and other people may disagree with this perspective. Um, I've not really discussed it with, with Scott, so he may disagree with it. But uh, from being an industry which was really dedicated by the dedicated specialist REIT investors, kind of made, you know, they, they told the narrative, stocks reflected their perspective, is that the incremental price setting today is done by generalist investors. So that's flows when the strategist says we need to be defensive, so we're going to buy utility stocks and we're going to buy energy stocks and we can have a few REITs as well. Okay, so then the generalist investor will say, okay, I'm going to have a few REITs. And for most of the time, there's still a kind of wariness amongst the general investors. It's only a kind of about a point and a half, two percent, but it's one of the go-to sectors to pick up yield. So in defensive times, these definitely have appeal for generalist investors. Where there's a reservation is, you know, the industry still hooked on FFO as a metric of cash flow and net asset value, and many generalist investors said, I don't want to do the brain damage understanding what those metrics mean. You know, you talk your own jargon, NOI, 
and cat rates and I don't have time for doing any of that because you know it is it's sobering to think I think Apple whilst it's come under pressure in the last month or so because we've seen some rotation out of the techie stocks I mean Apple's uh, capitalization as a single stock is vastly in excess of the entire wheat sector to put it in context so if you're an investor brain damaging your time is to try and out, figure out how to outperform it makes far more sense for you to spend time figuring out Apple's price the following day than it is to try and spend under time understanding what's happening in the REIT sector. Okay, it's a bit humbling, but that's the truth of the matter. So today, as I say, we sit here today, and I've had this conversation with many journalist investors over the last few years, as this trend has become more apparent, is I say to them, guys, go and buy um, American Tower, which is at 10% of the index, Go and buy Equinex, which is the biggest data center company. It's 5% of the interest. You're getting growth. You're getting technology, which you understand better than I do, quite frankly. Um, because to buy American Tower, you've really got to have an understanding of the telecom industry, and in particular, the Sprint T-Mobile merger, and all that, that went, we went through to get to that status. Our data centers, and again, probably we can discuss this more at length. I was involved in floating, and when in my Lehman days, um, I led the IPO as an analyst on a company called Dupont Fabros, which I've subsequently bought, got bought by De British Realty. The question I had going into it as an old dinosaur, real estate dinosaur guys, was how do you underwrite obsolescence and depreciation? And I still don't know to this day how you do that uh, because uh, you, it, there, at some point, those huge boxes that cost 150 million bucks a piece to put in place are going to be redundant. Right, and they're going to discover a way that you can. You don't have to have this huge box, which is so specialised that basically it's got no alternative value, and so it's a write-off. You don't have that capital risk with the towers, obviously, because it doesn't cost anything to put a tower up. Uh, but there's real depreciation slash obsolescence, which is impossible to underwrite. So in practice, what you do is you have to have a higher return to ju to justify paying the price. Right, or, or expressed in property terms, a higher cap rate to compensate you for that unknown factor. But um, probably I shouldn't tell this story, I'm taking up too much time on this, but I remember doing the IPO and the only people, the REIT guys weren't interested in it. And all of the generalists were saying, I can't buy a tech related stock that offers me a yield. So what gives? And so we talk about the REIT structure and I'd, sit, sit, I'd confess to them, I said, I have no idea whether the, these things are going to become completely redundant and obsolete on a five or 10 year time. And one serious PM that I, was talk, I talked to for half an hour, and I used to go home at the end of the day with no voice because I talked too long for too many people. He said to me, he said, David, you're worried about five years. I only concern myself with the next quarter, <laughs> right? Which really put in context the different time perspectives that you need to adopt when you're a real estate investor, when you're buying into a long duration asset, where it's important to have some residual value at the back end. Uh, uh, Scott, I'm assuming most of your investors, uh, your, the, your uh, students understand what I'm talking about when they're talking these terms, right? Yep, yep. A lot of the, residual, a lot of the lot of value in real estate is at the back end. It's not in current income, right? You do a DCF, it's in the residual value at the far end that you have to discount, right? Whereas uh, um, if you're involved in in in, in reading, uh, sorry, in, in tech investing, it's all about I need returns. I need twenty percent, right? I need the returns very quickly. You know, you're looking at very high short duration returns. You're not concerned with the, the duration of life of the asset for the most part. Okay, so what we're looking for? Let me just hit, hit these because I know I've spent a lot of time talking about those things on the left hand side. I mean, today, as we look at the markets, to me, there are three things and then one overriding thing. Scott touched upon these. We've got COVID, which is really kind of difficult to, to be definitive about, but I think the working assumption I have, and I think it's kind of consensus, is that we do get an effective, widely distributed uh, vaccine by the middle of next year, right? Which are, we should put us back on some kind of a path to a more normal pre-COVID type existence now. How that plays out economically, I don't know. But you know, it's another question. But I think that's the working assumption is what what's being priced in by risk assets as we speak today. The second thing is the economy, which is somewhat associated with COVID. And we can talk about K's and, and what are the uh, 
what did I think it was? A, it was a square root sign. The, the <laughs> down, up, and then sideways. You know, the K is a variation on that. We've got Ws. So again, you know, I'll leave that perhaps for in, in, in the end discussion. But the economy is the issue. Clearly, politics. And I wrote a paper, which actually uh, a note in my weekly, saying, you know, the Wall Street actually for once paying attention to Washington, uh, which it rarely does. But at the moment, we are paying a lot of attention to Washington. And again, let's just very briefly say that, um, you know, the market a couple of weeks ago when it had wobble, which is kind of seasonal in September anyway, there was real concern uh, that we'd have a close election or it would be close enough that it would be undecided for a period of time. And there's nothing more that risk asset markets hate than uncertainty. And that was a big uncertainty we were going to be potentially facing. I think as time has gone in the last week or two, and even as we speak, this is kind of evolving, I think people are now positioning themselves uh, that the, the election is probably not going to be uh, close and that we'll have less of a contested situation and that we could have potentially a um, sweep for the Dems. And then and I'll leave this for later. Uh, but, you know, what are the consequences of the sweep for the Dems in terms of policy and what that means for investment pricing and the economy? Uh, the third thing is. Um, and the, sorry, the fourth thing that really overarches this, and you can even see this in the way that the markets actually responded in this past day or two, that it took it plunge yesterday afternoon when the president says we're not we're not going forward with any stimulus. This morning, the market's up because you know basically with the Fed pumping liquidity into the marketplace at the moment, the buy the dips mentality is pervasive of all, all the other factors. So although COVID is tremendously important. For as, as individuals and as a society, and it's got economic consequences. The sense has been, and this is in truth, it's been in, in existence really since the 08, 08, 09 downturn, is the Fed is going to backstop asset pricing. It's more powerful today than at any time it's been than when I go back to 2009, uh, but it really is overriding those other factors of concern. Tax policy uh, will probably again lead to, to, to discuss a little later. Uh, the proposals from Biden, which you have to take more seriously. So the capital gains will turn the industry up, the real estate industry upside down. I don't think uh, very few people are really thinking this through, or at least I've seen very little comment on this. There has been plenty of comment on 1031, but that quite frankly is very secondary to seeing a capital gains tax rate, which goes to the same rate as income tax, which is what the Biden tax proposals do, because it means you're going to pay a little bit more on income, but you're going to pay twice as much on capital gain. So that all of the property structures that have been put in place using debt to minimize inc current income, which of course you can use the tax code to offset because of depreciation anyway. So you minimize income to back end your capital gain because you're only going to pay 20%. If that goes to 40, then basically you're going to have to redesign those structures. The other thing that's in there, sorry, the other thing we should also mention too, which is general importance, is there is the proposal in the tax, uh, sorry, the Biden tax proposals to go to take corporate taxes back up from 21 down up to 28, and to eliminate some of the loopholes that were, had always existed when we were in the 30s, uh, that the, the corporate America had pushed to get down. So 28 without the loopholes had probably put us on pretty much the same sort of basis as the rest of the world. So there would be less reason to be bleating that we're uncompetitive um, and that we can't invest here because the after tax returns aren't equivalent. 28 is a fair number in my judgment, particularly if you eliminate, you know, being able to write off the corporate jet and everything else that shouldn't be in there, it, particularly energy, actually, mm -hmm. given where the energy price is at the moment, less justification. Um, but if you just simply run the numbers, is that uh, an 8% move in corporate taxes means 9% of earnings, right? So all other things being equal, that would mean that the stock market should be 9% lower. <laughs> it's just to state the obvious. Fiscal policy we talked about, and I'd say the biggest thing in recent times that affects all asset pricing, and in particular, obviously, risk assets, is this commitment to the, by the Fed that's going to remain rates for the same rate for the next three years. Capital markets... Um, I'll whiz over this, but, um, you know, basically, you know, valuations are pretty stretched on any normal criteria. Um, and again, I'll leave this for a longer discussion a little later, but everything looks 
but everything looks cheap compared to the, the 10 year treasury yield of 0.75, you know, or even the 30 if you want to use 150, right? So people are forced to basically uh, buy uh, higher risk assets in order to make the returns. And this is particularly relevant for pension funds, long term investors, because they ain't going to get near, you know, they're promising their pensioners six, seven percent type returns. And if they've got to put, you know, they basically have to match their liabilities up. So they're forced to buy treasuries. But if you're bulk, if you're, a lot of your money is going into 10 year or 30 year, and it's sub two, then you're a long way short of hitting your bulky. Now those numbers will have to come down, that six or 7% promise will come down, but it still leaves you with a big gap to, to fill in. And in fact, that is actually a strong argument in favor of real estate investing, quite frankly, notwithstanding my arguments about capital gains and 1031s, et cetera, is that you know, there's more and more money going into alternatives um, from the long-term investors because they can't make it in the public markets. Um, and um, you know, if you look at REITs, for example, we're yielding you 4%. Uh, the S&P today is about 1.8. So again, on a yield comparison basis, it's all relative is that REITs themselves look attractive, you know, cap rates for even good quality properties, you know, some of them are in three, but four, four to five is a kind of good working number. So those are unlevered returns, I know, but again, alternatives will see more money going into them. Now they've got more risk, that's the big, big problem. The one criteria um, that um, really kind of supports equity relative to bonds is the, is the risk premium, uh, the, sorry, the equity, the earnings yield. Um, and uh, I don't know, Scott, have you discussed earnings yields with, um, with your uh, students? Not right. too deeply in capital markets. Okay, so, but the spread today is 500 bucks plus. And again, you just go back and leave it with the basic prim premise that all assets, most virtually all assets look cheap relative to the treasury market, uh, which is why you've got even people being comfortable about buying FANG stocks when they're trading at 30 times plus, um, and why you've got the overall market trading at 22, depending on where you want to peg those earnings. Um, so, okay, let me leave it at that. I can touch upon REIT earnings um, and valuations perhaps on a later slide. Okay, let me hand it back to you, Scott. And forgive me if I- Great, yeah, no, no that, was, that, was, that was amazing. That was great. I appreciate all the economic and political insight. Um, as we transition to the next slide, I want to pose two questions uh, that you kind of uh, touched on. One has to do with the impact of, of what is likely a permanent zero bound uh, yield curve. Um, is that going to favorably impact real estate and, and real assets in, in general with respect to funds flow and investor appetite? Um, I, I would say that um, you know, the invest I'm more comfortable about saying it underpins asset values I'm less comfortable about the signal it's sending in terms of the operating environment. Because, you know, basically you have low interest rates and the Fed's saying we're keeping interest rates low because on their own projections, we're not going back to a sub 4% unemployment rate anytime soon, right? It's going to be right. three or four years on their, their latest projections. Um, and also in, in that time too, you don't have uh, the sector of inflation. Now there is a debate out going on about there that you know the COVID has been deflationary because you've really taken a hit to both demand and supply within the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, you know there is concern in some quarters, and I'm not quite sure where I kind of come down on this. Um, I, I think it's probably got inflationary consequences because I do fear that both the Fed and governments won't pull back that support fast enough before inflation if it starts to pick up. And you are starting to see some inflationary tendencies come through on things like commodities, for example. You're not seeing it on oil, which is probably the best to signal, but some of the commodity pricing, look at timber, for example, shot through the roof. Because you've had, actually the housing market, the yep. same housing market has been really one of the strongest parts of the economy in this, in this period. I'm a bit questionable as to how long that's sustainable, given the labor market outlook, um, but it's certainly been one of the strongest things. So uh, to answer your question is, um, I, I think the asset pricing looks better underpinned than the operational side, because you don't get low rates without it signaling that the economy is soft. And that means sure. you don't have the space demand, you don't have the rental pricing power. Uh, the other question uh, from the last page, which, which dovetails really well with this uh, performance slide, 
uh, is talking about the, the shift from a, as a largely dedicated investor universe to a more of a generalist universe. I think that was one helpful in the early years of, of the REIT market and we probably will see that in emerging REIT markets globally where dedicated investors really kind of guide and, and shape the, the market. Um, but I think that was also leading to what was, you know, if I go back 15, 20 years ago, uh, a, a, a kind of a well understood rule of thumb that the public markets led the private markets in real estate by we'll call it six months plus or minus. Uh, I don't know that that is, is still a good leading indicator. You tell me, maybe the generalists have kind of diluted that, that fact. But as we look at the companies that have performed well, the sectors that have performed well, and the sectors that have not performed well so far this year, obviously it continues with our theme about digitization. Uh, and moving into I 4.0, we're seeing outperformance by infrastructure, which as you mentioned before was the cell towers, uh, data centers obviously, but also industrial, which is housing, uh, e-commerce distribution, and then significant laggards being hospitality uh, and retail, really anything that's experiential. We don't have many data points yet uh, in the private markets. There's been very few transactions. Mm -hmm. I think we all appreciate and agree that we're going to see similar performance here uh, once we start getting some transactions, whether those are, are foreclosure and distress trades. Um, but what's your thought on, on the public market still being a good leading indicator? And then we can dig into some, some additional performance numbers if, if there is any problem. Yeah, well, I, I am a strong believer that public markets are good leading indicators. Well, good is probably the right word. They are a leading indicator. It's like the old the story about the economist forecasting uh, nine out of the last three recessions uh, <laughs> is, is that uh, typically uh, equity pricing and, and uh, it really for you know it's not uh, it's not for no reason that we use forward multiples for example I mean now the market is really looking to uh, to the 21 multiple earnings earnings per share or FFO per share in 21 uh, to hang its hat on uh, I would say that that period is not only the normal discounting period um, is, is a year, 18 months. Uh, at times of optimism, it goes into perpetuity, like we're counting eyeballs, remember, in year 2000, in 1999, with yep. the tech boom. Um, but, um, and then in, in times of real stress, uh, then the focus moves less from earnings onto balance sheets and dividend security and your financial wherewithal. Uh, but ordinarily, it's a forward indicator. And REITs as public traded entities, and remember, going back to what I was saying, more so now than even when I first started as a REIT analyst back, a US REIT analyst, is um, they are owned by generalists. You know, the, 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 the price it's setting is essentially done in the hands of, 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 of generalist investors. And generalist investors are saying, what's the growth and what sort of multiple am I looking to pay as we look forward? Obviously, as we look forward, uh, there are, given the economic uncertainty and, and also layered into that, the policy, the taxation uncertainty that we just talked about is, you know, you'd have to sort of say, I really need a lower multiple theoretically to reflect that uncertainty. Because ordinarily at this time you'd say, okay, companies are giving guidance. I mean, half the S&P is not giving guidance, for example. It would be very interesting to see, you know, and probably only a minority of REITs are giving that guidance. Um, so as we look forward, um, you know, will companies provide guidance? When, when do they start to provide earnings guidance? I think, you know, we start earnings for the overall market uh, next week um, and um, with the big financials, the REITs sort of kick off the week later. It will be interesting to see how many of these companies actually kind of at least give us some kind of a guidance a forward look um, with, uh, with their third quarter numbers. Um, but I doubt whether people would be giving you much of a view on 21 because there are just so many variables. If your CFO, why stick your neck out? Right. Stock price is doing very nicely anyway. But you know, basically the analysts need to be spoon fed, which is what the earnings estimates really kind of provide by way of the guidance. So I think to your to your related point is what we've seen is there's been a massive divergence, probably more differentiated performance at the subsector level between the winners, as you call them on the next slide, I think, and the losers. Um, you know, you're seeing you know, very well managed companies in the mall space. I mean, obviously Simon is the one that immediately springs to mind. Tremendous balance sheet, tremendous growth, and the stock's down 50%. And it was down hard last year as well, right? Again, you go back to the accelerator point of secular change. So even a company with tremendous balance sheet and very, very good management and great assets that I believe will actually be of value, have some value, 
over time is they're getting pounded. I mean, if you're a hedge fund manager and you're short Simon and long Amazon, that's probably a trade that's going to continue to work, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. Yep. No fair point. The other side is obviously, um, again, if you if you want to have some exposure to a high yielding area and you want to have some exposure for generalist investor and you want to own the REITs, is you know you own some American Tower, which is now starting to pick up a little bit because we seem to be through the bigger uncertainties about the Sprint T-Mobile merger and the did there was a very big master lease deal that was signed about a week three weeks ago I think. And then the data centers have been kind of hot as a pistol all year. Um, and again, you know, those areas with work at home and people uh, in the lockdown um, and with it only sort of, you know, I mean, whether we, how fast we come out of that is a whole other point of debate. Uh, but, you know, those have seen a tremendous sort of surge in demand. So technology generally has been a beneficiary of, of, the, of the COVID environment. And then bricks and mortar areas of bricks and mortar have definitely been uh, have been uh, have been on the suffering end. I mean, many retail properties were closed. Many lodging uh, properties are closed. Um, and I think even you know, even sober analysis would tell you is that uh, business travel is going to take three or four years to come back, um, and maybe even a, maybe then at a lower rate. Um, and leisure. I think we'll come back before then, but it still could be a two or three year hold before we see, you know, those things pick up. Yep. So, you know, you saw when is it the pandemic? You see on the days, you know, the last couple of weeks, what we've seen is, is there has been some kind of rotational forces, um, people coming out, I'm talking more generally here, of, of the technology, looking to buy the cyclicals, because I think the working assumption is we get the vaccine and the economy is, you know, in a more robust, and more visible um, improvement phase by the middle of next year. So you really want to be taking out money from uh, some of the higher risk, the higher, uh, the very valued, the highly valued stocks, and you rotate it into the cyclicals, just playing the overall cycle. And what you see is, and, and again, this is by association, is the days when you can see when NASDAQ is under pressure, and remember 50% of the big tech is in NASDAQ, not in the S&P, where it's only about a third, is you see uh, our, the tech-related REITs, so the data centers and the, and the towers will come under pressure and you'll see maybe, you know, uh, and some of the retail stocks, which some people are sort of bottom fishing, thinking that there's a, you know, they're oversold uh, and things are, you know, represent good value. Should we buy those for the cycle? I'm reserved about that, I say, um, as to whether, you know, those stocks that really represent a kind of, uh, they call a dead money trade um, that, that you know you're really not buying uh, it's, there still could be pressures on those even if they appear to be extremely cheap on some metrics got it well we're starting to get a few questions and i think uh, a lot of them are, are around the topic you just discussed so let's dig in a little bit and, and feel free to you know take a pass if some of these are a little bit too uh, too direct uh, given okay. your, 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 your current investment position. But uh, one of them is, is expanding on Simon, actually. Um, do you think that there, while it might be long-term a good strategy to buy some of these retailers, do you think uh, Simon's going to continue to underperform as they go through that, that acquisition and digestion period? Or is their underperformance more generally related to the mall sector? It's, it's more generally. I mean, I think, you know, investor sentiment is so negative on the space. I don't see what the catalyst is that's going to change that. Simon is an extremely well-managed company um, and, um, and uh, you know, it's got a tremendous balance sheet. And I think it, uh, you know, the cost of its advantages is a cost of capital, which we've really not talked about in this, this conversation so far. Uh, but, you know, the pendulum swings um, between private equity um, we have an advantage of cost of capital, and then at certain points in the cycle, the public companies have an advantage. Um, and um, and again, actually, if the capital gains tax environment changes, as, as we were talking about, is that really is a big headwind against the private equity, the yep. real estate vehicles, um, and not to mention carried interest, which should have been eliminated years ago, in my judgment, as a tax-paying resident of this country. <laughs> Yeah, I'm getting off my political soap. <laughs> um, look, this slide brings to mind uh, David's question here about M&A. 
Uh, what are your thoughts about the M&A landscape? Are we going to see uh, much consolidation, particularly in these underperforming sectors? Or are we going to see privatizations? Or are we going to kind of see everybody kind of holding tight through this? So we, we've got two forms of M&A. And I don't know where the question specifically come in. There's, there's public to public, uh, which is still very much um, kind of one-off. Um, and you really need, uh, uh, ideally, uh, these deals should be structured. And most of them will involve some kind of a stock-for-stock -stock transaction. Um, and ideally, for those deals to, uh, to make sense from a financial viewpoint, um, and for the buyer to come out looking good is there needs to be a difference in the valuations. So that is kind of an underpinning, but ultimately it comes down to whether management wants to sell. So yeah, they'll, they'll continue to happen, but I, don't, I can't see that it's going to really be material. The thing that people are kind of looking for is the private equity, whether you're talking about Blackstone or, uh, or Brookfield, and there are many others as well, have very substantial cash reserves uh, that they are looking to deploy um, and they only get paid unless they deploy the monies now so one thing that happened uh, the prior cycles has been you can buy you can buy, write a check for 10 billion dollars five billion dollars in one go and take out one of these companies you get the money to work you don't want all the assets but you know basically some private equity model is you only hold period, hold it for a period of time, and the quicker you can get it out of the profit, the better you'll promote is quite frankly. Um, so um, are we trading now at discounts, and would management be receptive to a bid uh, that went somewhere close to where their own perceived value of NEV? I haven't, we haven't discussed valuations in this context, and NEV was kind of the valuation yardstick, which the industry held itself to, we are not in an environment where any investors, general investors are paying much attention to NEV. It is a squishy number. I say this as a chartered surveyor from way back when, although I have forgotten more than I ever learned, I have to say in that regard. Um, but you know, it's a squishy number. We don't have transparent accounting on this issue. Scott, you know I've talked about this before. I mean, the year I actually moved from real estate into the capital markets when I worked in the city of London, which is the equivalent of Wall Street, as some people perhaps are aware, is that was the year when Land Securities, which was the granddaddy of public, company, public property companies in the UK, adopted full mark-to-market, externally assessed valuation of the assets. 40 years on, we haven't got that here in the US. And I, and I don't know when we're gonna get it, uh, but you know, for me to try and put a cap rate on these, um, particularly on long leases, where I am not privy to material non-public information on the leases, for example, is, a, is a, a best guess at best, right? And those people, and I won't probably mention names, but those people that purport to be able to value these companies to pennies, that, come on guys. <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> well, well that's, that's a fair point though. So uh, is our valuations, whether it's in the read space or non-read space, really being overly impacted by, by the Fed actions and money come in, coming in from Robinhood and, and, and things like that. This is a question that, that we've received. Um, or are they, is, the, is the funds flow really pretty normalized for what we're seeing and valuations probably adequately reflect um, both expectations, whether it's digital and expectations, whether it's the hospitality guys? Okay. Um, so, you know, the fund flow has been, you know, in general investor interest in the group has not been high, you know, because as you know, um, for the last several months, you know, a lot of the interest in, uh, in, uh, in risk asset investing has really been focused on the FAM stocks, which are the five big technology stocks of Facebook, Amazon, Alphabet, um, um, uh, Microsoft and uh, Google, right? So Amazon, sorry, Amazon and, uh, and Apple. Let's get the, the acronym right. Um, and uh, that has been responsible for a lot of the uplift here. Um, and, um, and so, you know, why have the people gone into that? Those businesses have done terrifically well. You know, they're generating cash, um, those businesses. Now, there is a whole debate going on, and it's really relevant now because we've just seen this Democratic Dem Red Report out of the House saying we're going to regulate the big guys, right? They're having their Teddy Roosevelt moment, right? Yep. Trust busting. Um, I think that's coming. 
Um, how much the industry can kind of you know, water it down and keep it at bay is, is, is open to debate, I, I think. Uh, but clearly there are definitely voices that are saying, you know, we need to curb the power of big tech. Um, and so, uh, you know, how much will be rotated into uh, these other areas, uh, we'll see. I mean, again, if you think we're on a recovery path from next year, a really well-based recovery path in the economy, what are we going to grow FFO? You know, it's a metric of cash flow. It's 5% next year, right? We're down 5, 10% this year because yep. of COVID. Um, the market is actually, you know, the overall equities are down more, but they're going to bounce back quicker, right? I mean, again, you go back to the notion that real estate is, is kind of, it offers you yield, current yield, but is a lower growth investment in general over most of the cycle than general equities. And that's going to be evident in terms of, you know, the growth profile. We're looking at next year, assume all other things being go, the consensus numbers would suggest we're getting, looking at 10% plus. Well, if we do five in wheat land, I'd be surprised. Now, yeah. again, okay. you know, you, we may be in an environment where the tax changes in particular um, and the hunt for yield gives us support. Uh, but, you know, at this point in the cycle, it's not like, you know, you can bang the drum and say, investors are going to be really crazy to be or crazy enthusiastic about investing in REITs, right? You're going, to, you're, yeah. going to, you're going to want to get ahead of that recovery in earnings. Um, and it's going to be the cyclical sectors. So it's going to be, it's going to be um, industrials, it's going to be materials, it's going to be consumer discretionary, it's going to be, actually finance should do pretty well because you can, you can banks will write off all that bad loans where you're going to see underperformance on a subsector basis is going to be help the defensive areas like healthcare, utilities, um, energy probably doesn't do that well in that environment, I don't think anyway. So I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I think so. Um, look, we're getting a little bit short on time, um, but so I want to jump to this page real quick. You and I have discussed that uh, the recovery, whenever it starts to, to really set in, will probably look more like a traditional recovery. Yeah. Uh, one from the 90s that was, you know, after a supply driven, uh, if you will, recession, um, whereby we're going to see greater differentiation uh, of recovery versus no recovery by both geographic market, but also by property type. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you have any additional thoughts on here. We also, along those same lines, had a question about healthcare uh, and healthcare REITs. Um, how do you see them kind of recovering and picking up? Um, so maybe kind of weave the, the two of these together right. if you had any additional thoughts. Yeah, so this, this really represents consensus. And, and I can tell you as an investor, you make money by betting against consensus at the right time. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I just leave that as, as a thought. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds to me like you think the digital and industrials are a little bit fully priced and might be an opportunity to rotate out to more value. Well, again, <laughs> I, I'd, look at NAS, I'd look at the NASDAQ and I'd look at regulation. That, that's going to be, it's not like they're yep. going to regulate cell towers, but, you know, if, if, if the big NAS, the FAM stocks come in a little bit under pressure and there's this rotation I talked about, it's hard to see how digital and um, uh, mm. the, the data centers and the, and the cell towers continue to run. I mean, industrial looks fine because you've got e-commerce, but remember most industrial REITs, you know, they don't, uh, it's not hundred percent e-commerce, right? <laughs> it's like right. 10 or yep. 15, right? Yep. <laughs> I mean, the market loves to think of them as being e-commerce plays and they are to some extent. Um, and that's where the incremental demand for space is coming, but you know, they're not positioned fully on that score. Although we do seem to have more road, road, uh, road to run. So, uh, you know, I think the biggest question I kind of wrestle with is, you know, when the CBD office will come back, and I sit here in New York, as you do, uh, Scott, um, and um, I'm a firm believer that uh, although work from home has worked much better with Zoom, et cetera, than any of us thought, is it's not 100% substitutable. And I think in particular for younger people joining businesses, um, I, I do feel that, uh, you know, any serious business is, is gonna want people under the same roof, the creative, Spark is, is harder to create in two dimensions over screens than it is over, you know, the, off, the random yep. meaning. So, but I think it could be a while. And, and as you pointed out, I think in our earlier discussion is in effect, we've created too, we haven't built new space so much, but there's effectively too much of space. The other thing too is certainly relevant for New York is a lot of the space is given over to financial services, 
which is past peak. I mean, financial services is, is going to shrink as a part, as a portion of the economy. It overexpanded. We were overfinancialized, in my judgment, anyway. And other parts of the um, parts of the, the economy are going to go forward. Now, you were seeing this anyway because you're seeing tech come in. You're seeing Amazon, Facebook take space. But interestingly enough, they have been signing up leases. I mean, was it the uh, Farley Post Office was a lease that was signed mm -hmm. post-COVID or yep. in the COVID era? Yep. Uh, because um, uh, Facebook want to be in, the, in a physical building. And I yep. think young people will still, you know, the young people, the engineers will still want to be in that space. But you know the timing on that is going to be is going to be tricky, and then on healthcare, traditionally it's seen as being a defensive area, um, but you know clearly you know the big part of a lot of the public REITs has been senior housing, which suffered a couple of years of oversupply, and then we hit COVID, where there are real sort of you know there's, there's questions on the demand side. Do you really want to send Granny to the senior housing in the current environment because it was obviously a big area of problem in infection and death, unfortunately, of late COVID. Um, and, you know, clearly there's going to be more regulation and it's going to be a higher cost business as we go forward. So that's a challenge. You know, MOBs have been good. You know, we, we you know, life science looks like it's continue, will continue to be a hot area alongside high tech. There's only one company to play, right, in, in the public arena. Um, and I don't know whether we'll see others. Hopefully we will, but there's only one at the moment which is a terrific company. And interestingly enough, it is now the largest stock within the office sector. Yes. <laughs> by In far. respects, that's logical, but yes. Yeah, so, you know, whereas yeah. you look at Boston Properties, which is half of these two financial services, and that's going backwards relative to Alexander's yep. 50, uh, you know, uh, uh, growing in size. Um, and um, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, the other area is obviously hospitals. I think one of the lessons we have to learn as a country that we're going to need to invest in more in public health and the idea that you know we've got to have more facilities and we've got to have uh, more intensive care units we have an aging population which will demand it in my judgment the issue i have and this is where i'm as a visitor from a far place even after 25 years i can feel comfortable in saying that is i don't know how you know again we go back to we're buying long duration assets the health system in this country will still need massive overhaul at some point. It's not on a footing that it is fit for purpose. We spend twice as much for inferior outcomes as any other developed country. Now, you know, Obamacare attempted to reform, but you're, you're talking about, you know, changing 20% of the economy, right? There are enormous financial forces that resist change or want it done in a way uh, that isn't necessarily compatible with where we should end up. And so what my, my bit of a soapbox talk about this, as you can see probably here, it is a subject I thought and I'm somewhat passionate about, is that um, it's going to take a lot of change, but it will come because we don't have a, it's not sustainable with an aging population. And I don't know how, uh, if you're buying long duration assets, how you really handicap that possibility. Uh, now, you know, is it five years? Is it 10 years? My guess is that's the case. Remember the boomers were in peak retirement. There's 12,000 boomers a day retiring, right? I should be retiring myself, of course. <laughs> um, but, um, they, um, you know, that aging population is going to demand that we have, um, and the ones that are backing it up are going to demand change. And, and it's, it's a point of reservation um, for me um, in terms of investing in these long duration assets. Yeah. So that's a long answer, but I do think healthcare is quite challenged. But it's interesting that you've got these like three different parts of it that you really have to take consideration of when you're an investor. And MOBs has continued to be strong selectively. You know, the, the other bits, you know, senior housing, I think will come back in time. Um, and, but the uh, hospital bit, you know, I, I, I scratch my head. Got it, thank you. David, this has been an amazing conversation. Uh, I appreciate it. You're inside both the, the broader economy as well as the real estate space. We're just about out of time. Okay. Uh, maybe parting, parting thought, uh, S&P next year, read index next year, uh, oh, higher, geez. lower. <laughs> well, you did have that put my forecast that, you know, on the, on the, on the, on the day when Trump uh, announced that he got COVID, I took my head out. So the S&P is going to be higher by year end. So you're asking me next year, the end of 21? Yep. yep, I know that's a lifetime away. 
I think I think almost regardless of what happens in the economy. I mean, other than a serious downturn, right, which I and nobody else is really forecasting, but I, is not an impossibility because of the nature of you know COVID, which mm -hmm. makes one strong. I think the Fed support alone will will mean that we are higher on risk assets. So I would certainly say uh, that we are higher on the S and P and will be higher on uh, the REITs. The big bull case, I think, for real estate investing and, um, and and for REITs by association is this demand for yield. Yep. I, th I think, okay. that, and again, it's a function slightly of the Fed's behavior because there's such a shortage of yield product out there uh, that notwithstanding uh, the uh, the tax changes, which are going to be very bumpy if they're enacted, even even only half enacted, in terms of you know rate going on cap gains going to 30% as opposed to 20%. Um, is going to be it's going to be a bumpy ride, and going to have to cause a lot of kind of rethinking in, in real estate circles. I, I think uh, certainly if it goes to forty, um, you know a lot of things are going to have to be scrambled. You're going to be very busy in your mm -hmm. advisory role, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully <Right>? so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, David. Uh, appreciate all of this insight. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us today and your insightful questions. I'll send around the deck uh, in the next day or so, get that kind of cleaned up, and then we'll have this video according, uh, available for replay as well. Thank yeah, you, everybody. Anybody, I, anybody wanting to follow up with any questions, you certainly can reach out to me via uh, my NYU email, which I think is dbh06, if I'm not mistaken. I don't use it. That, I, I, do, I, do, I don't use it to send out much stuff. I mean, I will respond. <laughs> so, and you know where Scott is, obviously, as well. I'll make okay, sure it's guys. in the deck. All right. Very good. Perfect. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.